interest would be to see if we can draw people out and say, look, you know, we know you're injecting by yourself, but what you're using right now is uh, highly unpredictable and potentially deadly. And uh, here's an option for you to come just to get the drugs and uh, and use them. And then we we could start a process of, you know, connecting with people that we didn't even know existed. This is Mark Tyndall. He's the director of the British Columbia Centre for Disease Control in Canada. Many of these people who died, you know, really outside of a few emergency department visits are, are really off the radar as far as our medical system goes and uh, avoid medical care at all costs. So uh, this would be, a, I hope, a way to try to offer people uh, a way out. Welcome back to In Sickness and in Health, a podcast about health and social justice. I'm Dr. Celine Gounder. In this season, we're tackling the opioid overdose crisis, placing a spotlight on issues that aren't often covered in the news, like the link between childhood trauma and addiction, the role of law enforcement in drug treatment, and how fentanyl has compounded the opioid crisis. In today's episode, we're going to take a look at how medications can play an important role in helping people recover from addiction, and how sometimes those medications may be the very drug they're trying to quit. Yeah, my name is Paul Cherisher. I'm with the Philadelphia Overdose Prevention Initiative. I was a user and needed needles, clean needles, and it eventually got recruited to work at the Harm Reduction Coalition, and I worked there from 1997 to 2004. Heroin was a daily part of Paul's life for 30 years. Although he doesn't use any more, Paul was the poster boy for what we would call a chronic drug user. Growing up, Paul experienced a lot of trauma in the home. A lot of criticism, a lot of judging. My parents were older, a lot older, and were traumatized by the depression and the, their life experience, and they, they didn't have very good coping skills, and they, I mean, they had very poor parenting skills particularly around communication. And so, like, there was really no intimacy in my life. For most of his childhood, Paul's parents were either distracted or bickering. And as the years went by, his parents' relationship worsened. I don't know. There's something just happened in their relationship. It just started going downhill. And there was a lot of fighting. And later on, they had financial problems. Right when I entered adolescence, I kind of was abandoned, basically, to live on my own. I was an only child. When Paul was around 18 or 19, he went to college in the Berkeley area, but soon dropped out. He started taking psychedelics and moved into a communal home in San Francisco with people who identified as gay or bi. I found my way to San Francisco and got involved in the punk scene. I met this guy. I kind of latched on to him because he was like everything that I wanted. I mean, he was outrageous, or I was very controlled and repressed. He was in just this outrageous queen, and, he, and his friends were like these outrageous drag queens. It was 1980. San Francisco was in the throes of sexual liberation in the gay community, and Paul was enveloped in a scene at the intersection of LGBT counterculture and punk rock counterculture. A big part of that world at that time was drugs. There was this whole scene of just this, this crazy scene that I wound up in, and there was lots of drugs. First speed, and then heroin. Paul tried heroin and became addicted. For years, Paul injected heroin every day, and at points also sold heroin to support his habit. In the early 80s, Paul tried to quit a few times, but had trouble staying clean. Eventually, he moved to New York City. It was there that Paul started working at a harm reduction center and going to therapy. I finally started like learning to be a person, I guess. I mean, I was in my probably 40 by then, and I started, I just started changing. I was breaking some of my negative behavior patterns, because in the past, I really didn't know how to make friends with people, and I would sabotage the relationships, and then I would give up. But then I started, like, I don't know, I was in, I was in a stable situation at this office. There's a good crew of people there, and we started becoming friends. If you want to stop your use, that you need to deal with your problems. Paul's life was starting to stabilize and he finally had a support system to help him with his addiction. But he still needed a fix. The thing with opioid addiction is, stopping cold turkey is really hard. 
In fact, the expression cold turkey refers to goosebumps drug users get when they go into withdrawal. But that's the least of it. Going into withdrawal is like being deathly ill from the flu. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, cramps, sweats, chills, and horrible muscle and bone pains. People get really anxious and depressed. And it makes it hard to function, and it's one of the reasons that heroin users function so poorly, because they're constantly living with that fear of going into withdrawal. And that's why many long-term drug users need some kind of fix. Not to quote-unquote get high, but rather to stave off withdrawal symptoms so they don't feel sick. To ease the effects of withdrawal symptoms, many addiction treatment programs prescribe medications like methadone or buprenorphine. Both are prescription opioids that are taken by mouth. And because they're opioids, like heroin, they bind the same receptors in the body and block the symptoms of withdrawal. But in contrast to heroin, they're FDA-approved drugs. Their production is regulated, the product is clean, and dosing is standardized. Methadone and buprenorphine, unlike heroin, stick around in the body for a lot longer, which means drug users only need to take it once a day to ward off withdrawals and makes it a lot more convenient to use. And because of how methadone and buprenorphine work, they don't get people high the way heroin does. I don't think that people take methadone because it's such a great high. (laughs) And Suboxone, too. I don't find it very pleasant. I always get really nauseous from it. I mean, it's a dependency. You're dependent, but the whole point of it is that you're dependent on something that you get in a regulated manner, and that's not going to bring you other problems, taking it like exposure to infectious disease and law enforcement. So it's much less harmful for people's lives, and it helps let them stabilize their lives. In other words, addiction treatment programs provide drugs like methadone and buprenorphine, the active ingredient in Suboxone, to stave off withdrawal symptoms, so users don't turn to heroin. And if they're replacing their heroin with methadone or buprenorphine, drug users are also a lot less likely to use dirty needles or buy drugs on the street, which these days are often laced with fentanyl and other adulterants. Instead of hustling to get their next fix to stave off withdrawal, users can focus on stabilizing their lives, getting a place to live, rebuilding relationships, regaining a sense of purpose, working on the problems that led them to use in the first place. And then the risk of relapse goes down by a lot. For Paul, the strategy of slowly tapering off methadone and suboxone, and then pairing that with therapy, that's what helped him eventually stop using heroin. At a certain point, I just cut back on my use. It took me like two or three years to do it, just gradually cutting back from like skipping the weekends, then doing it just on the weekends, to then doing it once a month or twice a month. And gradually until I stopped using altogether and I just went on methadone and stabilized the methadone for, I don't know if it was six months. And then I started to taper and did that for about 18 months. And then I switched to uh, Suboxone. And then I did that for maybe a year and a half. And then I went off of it. I just stopped it one day. Paul now lives in Philadelphia, where he's done a lot of organizing to bring harm reduction strategies to the city. And his hard work is starting to pay off. In early 2018, Philadelphia announced plans to open a supervised consumption site. It would be among the first in the country. Although methadone and buprenorphine are first-line treatments for opioid withdrawal, a fraction of users don't respond to these treatments. So some folks relapse which can lead to overdose and death. For years, many in the addiction field have felt powerless to bridge that gap, to help those who fall through the cracks. But are there alternatives? To understand more, let's turn to Switzerland to learn about one solution that many might think counterintuitive, even fringe.
In the early 1990s, Switzerland was facing an explosion in heroin use. Zurich was notorious for having Europe's largest open drug scene. There were too many overdoses, too many HIV and hepatitis transmissions, too many bacterial complications. Drug-related crimes like theft surged. Drug camps mushroomed. Things seemed pretty grim. Fast forward more than 25 years, and drug users new to heroin are few and far between in Switzerland. So in those intervening years, what did Switzerland do? And what can we learn from them? My name is Barbara Brewers, and I'm now the head of a substance abuse unit, or the unit for dependencies, we call it here, at the primary care health department. I'm also active at the more national level. I'm the vice president of the Swiss Federal Commission for Drug-Related Affairs and of the Swiss Society for Addiction Medicine. Barbara has been on the front lines of Swiss drug policy for years. In the early 90s, at the height of Switzerland's heroin problem, officials didn't have clear solutions. Traditional law enforcement tactics weren't working. The government decided to try a harm reduction approach as part of a broader policy. They introduced measures like access to clean syringes and large clinics with oral opioid substitution treatment, where users could get methadone and other services. But quite quickly, people realized that there was a small group that did not really want to go into these oral substitution treatments or who failed in the treatment, who said, it's not the same for me. As is the case for so many medical conditions, what works for one patient doesn't always work for another. Therapy needs to be individualized. Some people said, you know, methadone, I don't feel well with, I don't function well with, I sleep all day, I cannot function well. That's one thing. Other people... They were really also, let's say, addicted to the addiction part. They liked the ritual, and they they feel better with heroin. They really feel better. Many of these users repeatedly failed in conventional substitution treatments. So the Swiss government decided to take a chance on a radical idea. It was decided in the 1992-3 that we should do something else for them and try to see what happens when you provide the substance they prefer in the way they like it. So that means real heroin by injection. So starting in 1994, Switzerland started providing prescription heroin as a last resort for that fraction of drug users, that 25% or so for whom methadone and buprenorphine don't work. And in 2008, Swiss voters agreed to make it an official piece of national drug policy. Here's how it works. Heroin never leaves the treatment center, so patients have to visit the clinic a couple times a day to receive their prescription heroin under medical supervision. While there, they can also get treatment for other medical or mental health issues. The program is highly regulated, and every patient needs to have federal authorization to be in the program. Okay, to many who haven't heard of heroin-assisted treatment, This might sound crazy. The idea here is to go one step beyond supervised consumption sites. You might remember supervised consumption sites from our last episode. These facilities give drug users a safe, clean place to use, off the streets and out of public spaces, with sterile equipment. If someone overdoses, medical staff is on hand and at the ready to intervene. Prescription heroin programs take it one step further. These clinics give drug users the heroin they want. But this heroin is different. It's pure, unadulterated, and outside of the black market. Street heroin is extremely dangerous because we don't know what's in it. It exposes people to a lot of risks related to the quality of the product, the context of buying, Uh, the consequences of getting caught, the problem of using it in an unsafe place. The results of the prescription heroin program have been very positive for drug users who don't do well on methadone. The NAOMI trial, a randomized controlled trial, the kind of study that's considered the gold standard of proof in medicine, demonstrated the effectiveness of heroin. The trial compared heroin versus methadone, to treat drug users who'd already tried methadone to quit, but were not successful. The Naomi trial showed that when these drug users were given heroin instead of methadone, 
they were far more likely to stay in treatment and far less likely to use street drugs or engage in other illegal activity. You might say, well, obviously, they're being given the drugs they want, so obviously they'll stay in treatment. But what's the point of giving them heroin if you want them to stop using heroin? And even worse, aren't we rewarding them for their behavior, helping them get high? Well, for one thing, they're not getting very high doses of heroin, but rather just enough to make them comfortable, to ward off withdrawal, but not to get high. And what they're getting is a safer product, not laced with fentanyl or other adulterants. So they're less likely to overdose, to have complications of drug use, and to die. If you really want to be abstinent, help them to get there. But it's not by leaving people in the street, uh, getting all kinds of diseases, doing criminal things to get the products and put them at risk to get into contact with the police, with, with people who, you, who misuse them, etc., etc. So you as a parent, what do you prefer? You know your child is taking drugs. Do you prefer that it is done under supervision? You know, with the people who know the drug and help your child to, to get rid of the side effects, to get rid of everything and to, to get forward into life? Or do you prefer your child is in the street and gets no help, is, is fully alone and, and takes a drug which is potentially dangerous because he doesn't know what's in it? Although prescription heroin works for a small group of the population, Barbara emphasized that this is the last line of defense and just one option from a menu of harm reduction interventions that have helped turn the tide in Switzerland. We should not think that we should propose this to everybody. It's for a particular group of people. Methadone is a a very good treatment, and buprenorphine also. Oral treatment is and should be always the first-line treatment for people, because it's the most convenient form of using a substance orally. If you provide it in a correct way, supervised way, it is really a very safe treatment for a large majority and for a cost that is not comparable to heroin prescription. Because prescription heroin is tightly regulated, far more so than just about any other drug in Switzerland, it's a highly bureaucratic process. And because it's given intravenously, or IV, it requires a different level of medical supervision that is very personnel intensive, requiring staff 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. This drives up the costs by a lot. Plus, some people think that having to go to a clinic multiple times a day to get heroin is really restrictive. It's hard to do much else, and that can get in the way of the other work that needs to be done on the road to recovery. They're highly medicalized and not acceptable to, I think, the majority of people using drugs who don't want to go to a place three times a day and have their drugs observed. That's Mark Tyndall. You heard him at the top of the show. He's the director of the British Columbia Centre for Disease Control in Canada. Mark has been leading the charge to develop new, out-of-the-box solutions for the opioid overdose epidemic in Canada. It's urgent. Just in British Columbia last year, almost 1,500 people died from opioid overdoses. 80% of those deaths involved fentanyl. In BC, we had over 20,000 overdose calls. In in the province of British Columbia, over 20,000 overdose calls last year and 1,500 deaths. And clearly, we can't get all those people in a highly medicalized, expensive program. So uh, that's what led to the idea that, well, we need to just get back to giving people some hydromorphone pills. The Crosstown Clinic in Vancouver has been providing pharmaceutical-grade heroin to drug users for years. But it's a small program and too expensive to expand and take to scale. And that's why Mark and others have been looking for alternatives, other options for drug users who don't do well on methadone or buprenorphine but cheaper than prescription heroin, and legal. Hydromorphone, a potent prescription opioid also known as Dilaudid, seems to fit the bill. In 2016, a landmark study showed that chronic drug users who failed therapy with methadone or buprenorphine, that 25% or so that seems to do better on heroin-assisted treatment, they did as well on hydromorphone as they did on heroin. In other words, Hydromorphone was found to be as effective as prescription heroin. 
Okay, so now we've got another oral prescription opioid in our toolbox, hydromorphone, in addition to methadone and buprenorphine. But how do we ramp up access safely so these treatments get to people with addiction, but don't create new users? To solve that, Mark had another idea, an ATM that dispenses hydromorphone. The idea of getting them through a machine, I think, is a good one where we could, you know, make it more available but still regulate the amount of pe- that people get out of it. The British Columbia Centre for Disease Control has gotten approval from the Canadian government to pilot and study three hydromorphone dispensing machines. Drug users deemed to be at high risk for drug overdose would be registered in the program and could get two to three hydromorphone pills three times a day from the machines. The cost per patient would be under $2.50 a day. To put this in perspective, heroin-assisted treatment at the Crosstown Clinic in Vancouver costs almost $20,000 per year for one person. Hydromorphone ATM machines are a whole lot cheaper. And as far as safety, these machines are highly controlled. It's a 715-pound steel box, more like an ATM, that regulates in real time every pill coming out. Um, it's biometric, so people put their finger on a pad to identify them, and uh, and they get the pills out. And as I say, we could account for them in real time. So me, for me, this is just a technology that would allow us to regulate the drugs very closely, uh, send messages to people, and, um, and make a, a form of connection, and also give the message of some autonomy to people. So they, if, if for days when they really don't want to face somebody face-to-face, which is a lot of days for people, um, that they can just go and get it. For Mark, the technology is well-suited to break down some of the barriers to entry to the medical system, giving drug users access to a safe supply of drugs while cutting out the black market with its dangerous drug dealers and traffickers, even where drug treatment programs are scarce. So we have a lot of hotspots around the province where there's no real access for people to get on methadone even if they wanted to. So we could uh, strategically set them up at these places. It's also a way, Mark hopes, to draw out drug users who too often stay in the shadows and out of the reach of medical and social service providers. I think the other thing that uh, has real promise and that we really need to test out in our um, in our research is if this can draw people out of their isolation. So we could put a supervised injection site on every street corner in the whole province and we'd still miss about 60 or 70 percent of the people who aren't coming to these kind of uh, initiatives. Mark is hoping that hydromorphone dispensing machines could eventually connect people who were previously using alone to services and medical care. Seventy percent of people who die of an overdose die alone, are found alone. And so many of those deaths today are due to fentanyl. If you told a patient, look, I can't, you know, I can't prescribe you this anymore. Um, um, You have to go out on the street and use. Um, They would, and they'd find uh, white powder heroin and uh, or or pharmaceutically diverted pills, and uh, they would use them, and they wouldn't die. Now fentanyl has sort of changed everything. So um, all of a sudden, if you send people out without a prescription for opioids, then they're uh, they're going to get something that could very well kill them. To Mark, the situation is critical, one that mandates an emergency response, especially since overprescribing of opioids by doctors fueled much of the addiction. Clearly trying to, you know, limit or prevent people from accessing these drugs unnecessarily is just, you know, reasonable prescribing practices. I think we do need to do our part in not prescribing drugs needlessly, but that is much different from the person who comes in uh, begging for a prescription because they're dependent on these drugs and withdrawing and saying, I'm sorry, we can't do that, and basically telling them to go find their own. 99 times out of 100, that, that is not meaning they're not going to use, they're going to find alternative sources. So we're really exposing a lot of people to uh, a very dangerous drug supply. Over the last three episodes, we've heard a lot about harm reduction programs. From the Allegheny County Jail Cooperative, we learned about parenting and relationship coaching 
and how these strategies can be used to prevent intergenerational transmission of trauma and addiction. We heard about decriminalization, not legalization, of drugs in Portugal, the forerunner to Seattle King County's pre-booking diversion lead program, both of which direct drug users to social services to get them housed and into treatment. We've also talked about supervised consumption sites, how they take drug use off the streets and into safe places where drug users can access medical and social services. And in this episode, we learned about medication-assisted treatment, which helps drug users control withdrawal symptoms and allows them to stabilize, get housing, and work on the problems that drove them to use drugs in the first place. Success is about how you define it. None of these solutions is about sending drug users to jail or prison. But all are backed by data showing they work. If you define success in terms of saving lives today and tomorrow. Next time, we'll talk about what can happen when harm reduction isn't a part of the response to opioid abuse and addiction. In the past, we thought of opioid abuse and addiction as a problem of urban blight. But in the past couple of years, it's become very much a problem of rural America and suburbia. In late 2014, opioid and injection drug use hit rural Indiana, starting an outbreak of HIV and hepatitis. We'll hear about what happened, how public officials responded, and where conditions are ripe for this to happen again. Today's episode of In Sickness and in Health was produced by Nora Ritchie and me. Our theme music is by Alan Vest. You can hear more about this podcast and how to engage with us on social media at insicknessandinhealthpodcast.com. That's insicknessandinhealthpodcast.com. If you or a loved one needs help, you can reach out anonymously and confidentially to SAMHSA's National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP. That's 800-662-4357. SAMHSA stands for Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. You can also find treatment online at findtreatment.samhsa.gov. That's findtreatment.samhsa.gov. I'm Dr. Celine Gounder. This is In Sickness and in Health.